Story 2 of Four Science Fiction Stories by G. L. Vandenberg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jubilation, USA Torrell pointed the small cryptopter toward the wooden horseshoe-shaped sign. The sign's legend was carved in bright yellow letters. Sartan, Torrell's companion, watched up and down the open highway for signs of life. In seconds the small cylindrical mechanism completed the translation. The sign said, Jubilation U.S.A. The doggonest, cheeriest little town in America. The two aliens smiled at each other. Unaccustomed to oral conversation, they exchanged thoughts. The cryptopter worked incredibly fast. The language is quite simple. It would seem safe to proceed. The sign indicates friendliness, thought Torl, the older of the two Capellans. Very well, brother, replied Sartan, though I still worry for the safety of the ship. Sartan, our instruments tell us that anyone who discovers the ship, Torl explained a trifle impatient, will show a remarkable degree of curiosity before they display any hostility. Sartan agreed to dismiss his worries, and the two aliens began to walk along the barren highway. Before them, at a great distance, they could see a cluster of small frame buildings. When they had walked a hundred feet or more, they encountered another sign. Jubilation, USA! Welcome, stranger! See America first and begin with jubilation! And several hundred feet further, two more signs. The Rotary Club of Jubilation welcomes and extends the warm hand of friendship to you. You are now entering paradise, brother. Howdy, stranger. Come right on in, stay a while, and make yourself to home. Jubilation Chamber of Commerce As members of a peaceful race, Torl and Sartan naturally found the signs encouraging. They walked at a sprightly pace. A whirring noise behind them brought the two to a halt. They turned to discover a pre-war chivy choking its way along the road. The aliens edged their way to a gully along the side of the road. They were confident of a friendly reception, but, in the event their calculations had been wrong, they poised themselves to make a break in the direction of their ship. The ancient chivy sputtered by. The driver was almost as ancient as the car. A bearded fellow with a stogie stuck between his teeth and a crushed hat on his head. The driver slowed down when he saw the aliens. How the strangers? he called cheerily. Say, ain't you fellers a mite warm in them coveralls? He cackled merrily, put his foot to the floor, and sped on by. Sartan looked at his companion. I am sorry. I should not have doubted you, brother. You were right. These people will welcome our visit. They seem very cordial. Good, Sartan. Let us continue. One hundred yards further, they were confronted by still another brace of signs. They stopped once more. City limits. Gambling allowed. Jubilation. Where troubles never come due, cause the good Lord takes a liking to you where gloom and doom are outlawed and there's never any sadness, where a smile lights up the midnight sky and gives off only gladness. Gambling allowed. The second sign was another in the shape of a horseshoe. Beyond this point you have 4,372 friends you never had before. Gambling allowed. Suddenly Torl stopped and played with several switches and dials on the cryptopter. "'What is wrong, brother?' asked the puzzled Sartan. "'I receive no direct translation for the term gambling.' "'What is the closest term the machine gives?' "'Fraternizing.' Sartan laughed. "'Now it is you who fret, Toril. According to the signpost legends, fraternizing would seem to be accurate.' A steady rolling sound of passionless, one-armed bandits drowned out all other noise in Oki's oasis bar. As a result, Torl and Sartan drew little attention when they entered. 
Except for their blue metallic spacesuits, they looked like, and were, ordinary humans. They proceeded rather timidly toward the bar. Oki, the proprietor, was on duty readying the place for the night shift. Torl held up his hand. The cryptopreter had already informed him that oral conversation was the manner of communication on this strange planet. Such conversation had long ago been abandoned on the planet Capella, but learned men such as Torl and Sartan were familiar with how it was done, though when they spoke they sometimes had to halt between syllables. Howdy! Torl flashed a wide grin at the barkeep. Just hold your horses there, mister was Oki's sharp reply. You ain't the only snake in this desert. There's four customers ahead of you. Sartan transmitted an admonishing thought to his companion. Torl, you should have noticed that the man was busy. He has only two hands. Forgive me, brother. I was blinded by my own excitement. The two capellans waited, and were soon attracted by the silver-handled machines that seemed to have most of the customers fascinated. Sartan wandered over to where a small group of men were gathered around a single machine. A huge man, raw-boned and crimson-faced, wearing surplus army suntans, was operating the machine. The big man dropped a large coin into a slot. He gave the silver handle a vicious snap. It made a discordant, bone-crushing sound. Three little wheels, visible under glass, spun dizzily. Anxious, screwed-up faces looked on as the first little wheel stopped. Bell fruit. A collective gasp went up from the small crowd. The second wheel stopped. Bell fruit. Another gasp. Sartan touched the arm of the man operating the gambling device. I beg your pardon, but could you please tell me— The man wheeled around like a bear aroused from hibernation. Hands off, mister. You trying to jinx me? The third little wheel stopped. Lemon. The crowd groaned. The big man turned on Sartan again, a wild and furious look in his eye. You jinxed me. Damn you, I ought to bust you one right in the snout. My humble Apollo, geez, sir, the bewildered Sartan began. I'll give you your humble apologies right back with my fist, roared the gambler. Torl quickly made his way through the small crowd, which by now was itching to witness a fight. Excuse me, sir, but my friend did not real eyes. The hell he didn't, the gambler fumed. He was trying to jinx me, by God, and I'm gonna teach him to keep his paws. Okay, okay, you guys break it up. It was Oki, massive and mean-looking, using his barrel belly to push his way through to the two aliens and the unlucky gambler. What's going on here, Smokey? he inquired of the gambler. Oki, I had a jackpot working when this dumb jerk here ups and grabs my arm. Tarl interrupted with, My friend is sorry for what he did, sir. Oki stabbed a cigar into his mouth. Who are you guys, anyhow? Where'd you dig up them crazy coveralls? Such a queer way to dress in this heat, spoke a voice from the crowd. This was the moment of pride that Torl and Sartan had looked forward to. They both grinned confident grins. We have come to you from Capella, he said with some exultation. Oki's face went blank. Capella? Where the hell is that? Sounds like one of them damn hick towns in California, said Smokey, the gambler. Torl, somewhat deflated, but by no means defeated, hastened to elucidate. Capella is located in the constellation which you call Auriga. Anybody know what the hell he's talking about? asked the annoyed saloon-keeper. Tarl and Sartan exchanged troubled glances. Sartan took up the cudgel. Auriga is a constellation, a star cluster, sir. It is forty-two million light-years away. What in tarnation is a light-year? asked an old-timer in the group. Another replied, They must be from Alaska. 
they got light years up there. Sometimes stays light the whole confounded year round. That must be it, agreed Oki, and that's why they're wearing them crazy suits. The saloon keeper unloosed a grim laugh. You can take them arctic pajamas off now, boys. Weather's kind of warm in these parts. Hey, fellas, a voice shot out. Did you bring any Eskimo babes down with you? The crowd roared approval at the witticism. Torrell transmitted a depressing thought to his companion. I fear they do not believe us, Sartan. Sartan did not get the opportunity to answer immediately. Listen, you guys. Oki pounded his fat finger into Sartan's chest. I want you to behave yourselves, understand? Now that means lay off the customers while they're at the games. You want to gamble? There is plenty of machines available. I got a respectable place. I want to keep it that way. He turned and addressed the other men. All right, boys, fun's over. No fight today. Drink up and gamble your money away. Let's get back to the games. It was necessary for Torl to use the cryptopter to translate the various signs along the bar. Oki saw the small, cylindrical machine sitting on the bar. His curiosity bested him. He gave it a more thorough examination than a dog gives a fireplug. Some of the signs read, Double Bourbon, Two Dollars Ten Cents, Cool Gin Ricky, One Twenty Five, In God We Trust, But Nobody Else, Rum Collins, One Dollar, A Friend in Need is a Friend Indeed. No Indian served here. And Scotch imported a dollar fifty, domestic a dollar thirty. Cool gin rick e, said Turl. Coming right up, Oki mumbled his attention, still wrapped around the cryptopter. Say, what is this gadget, anyway? It is a cryptopter, Turl grinned with pride. It enables us to understand and speak your language. Ah, oh, go on. Oki managed a faint-hearted grin, uncertain of whether his leg was being pulled. Come on now, tell me what it is. But I have told you, sir. The barkeep cursed under his breath. Two gin rickies, did you say? Yes. Oki brought the drinks. Sartan smiled broadly. Thank you exceedingly. That'll be two fifty. Torl raised his glass as though making a toast. Two fifty, he repeated. Oki caught his arm and brought the glass down. Two fifty, the barkeep said with grim insistence. Sartan pursed his lips comprehendingly. He removed a large, pentagonal piece of metal from his pocket and gave it to Oki. Oki took the piece between his fingers, examined it, and frowned. I give up. What is it? Sartan had to glance at Torl for an answer. Torl threw a switch on the cryptopter. Money, Torl silently advised him. Money, said Sartan to Oki. You guys hold on and don't drink up yet, growled the barkeep. He then yelled in the direction of the blackjack table. Hey, Nugget. Get on over here. I need you. A wiry little man with a full, unkempt beard hustled over to the bar. Nugget McDermott at your service, Oki. With your pleasure, he asked with a sunny smile. Take a look at this. Oki handed him the piece of metal. The old prospector turned it over in his hands, bit it, and then held it in his palm as though to judge its weight. His expert opinion was, It's gold, Oki and was uttered without a shred of modesty. "'Are you sure?' The old-timer was highly insulted. "'Am I sure? Why, you lop-eared sunstroke jackass! Of course I'm sure. Nugget McDermott is drawed to gold like nails to a magnet. Why, when this here town was nothing but a patch of cactus, all right, all right,' Oki waved him off, "'don't get your gander up. Go on back to the blackjack table and tell Sam to give you a drink on the house. Much obliged, Oki, much obliged, said Nugget, doffing his cap and trotting back to the blackjack table. The barkeep's face was pure sunshine when he turned to the aliens again. Gentlemen, 
With this kind of a substitute, you don't need money in my place. Drink up. Thank you, exceeding Lee, said Sartan. Oki arbitrarily judged the gold piece to be worth ten dollars. The management invites you to try your luck, gentlemen. Go on, give it a whirl. Tarl and Sartan wore blank expressions as Oki slapped seven dollars and fifty cents change on the bar. Four silver dollars, four half dollars, and six quarters. Don't be bashful, gentlemen. Oki's machines are friendly to one and all, said the barkeep. Torrell removed the change and gave his companion two silver dollars, two half dollars, and three quarters. What is the purpose of the machines? thought Sartan as they approached the one-armed bandits. I suppose that is what the one called Oki wishes us to learn. Perhaps it is some type of registration machine? It is doubtful. The gentleman you disturbed has been at the same machine since we arrived. Sartan gripped the handle of a vacant machine. Do you think it might be a kind of intelligence test? In lieu of an answer, Tarl focused his attention on a small card above the machine which gave the winning combinations. There is that term again. What term? Gambling. Tarl pointed to a line on the card, warning miners not to gamble. A look of perplexity fell upon his face. I am no longer sure the term has anything to do with fraternizing, he observed mentally. Let us find out. Sartan placed a quarter in the coin slot. The three little wheels went spinning. Cherry, lemon, lemon. Nothing. Tarl and Sartan looked at each other, their faces blanker than ever. Try it again. Sartan disposed of another quarter. They waited. Lemon, plum, plum. Nothing. Tarl inspected the machine from every angle, like a man on the outside trying to figure a way in. Let me try it. He put a quarter in the slot. Three lemons. It isn't very interesting, is it? thought Sartan. Why don't we try the larger pieces? A splendid idea, brother. The larger coins did not fit. Tarl proceeded to report this sad state of affairs to Oki, and was amazed when, for the eight large coins, Oki rewarded him with twenty-four smaller ones. He went back to his companion at the one-armed bandit. They then dropped twenty consecutive quarters into the appropriately named machine without getting so much as a single quarter in return. It is puzzling, is it not, brother? Yes, Sartan. From all indications, it would seem to be a machine totally without purpose. It does consume money. But why would one build a machine whose sole purpose is to consume money? Sartan gave it some hard thought. I don't know. Remarkable, Torl concluded. But nothing is done without a purpose. Obviously we've found something that is. No, I do not believe that. Let me have the electro-analyzer. The aliens were so engrossed in their problem as to be unaware that Oki and two men at the bar were casting suspicious eyes on them. Sartan fished around in his pocket and produced a small object in the shape of an irregular triangle. Tarl took the electro-analyzer from him, removed the cover, and moved his finger around inside. He replaced the cover and slapped the electro-analyzer against the side of the one-armed bandit. When he took his hand away, the small object stuck to the machine like a leech. Oki scratched his head and addressed one of the two men at the bar. What the hell you suppose they're doing, Sam? What's that gadget for? Search me, replied Sam, a well-dressed, stoop-shouldered gent. But if you want my opinion, it doesn't look legal. Hey, Nugget called the barkeep. Again the little old prospector hustled himself over to the bar. Nugget McDermott at your service. What'll it be, Oki? Go on over and get the sheriff. Tell him there's two queer characters here trying to jimmy one of my machines in broad daylight. The old man's feet kicked up sawdust as he scampered out the door. Oki kept his attention riveted to the two aliens. 
Tarl was busy adjusting the electro-analyzer to the best possible position. What if it does not respond to this machine? Sartan wanted to know. I do not think the machine contains any type of metal with which we are unfamiliar. We will have a reading in one minute. The aliens took a step backward and waited. A sudden noise, like that of a television tube exploding, jolted everyone in the room, including Torl and Sartan. The blackjack table emptied, gamblers left their machines, a semicircle of the curious formed around the two aliens. Oki lit out from behind the bar and elbowed his way through the crowd. The aliens' concentration was unbroken by the attention they had aroused. With all the single-mindedness of religious fanatics, they continued to observe the strange mechanical device. Oki was dumbfounded to find the machine still in one piece, and doubly dumbfounded to discover it was behaving in a most unconventional manner. It was emitting a low, steady, gurgling sound, and an occasional sputter or burp. The legs of the machine seemed unsteady. Its body lifted back and forth in herky-jerky motions like an old-fashioned washing machine. The three little bell-fruit wheels were spinning at the speed of an airplane propeller. Oki thought they might never stop again. "'What the hell are you crazy galoots doing to my machine?' he bellowed. Before the aliens could answer, there was another explosive sound, causing the crowd to jump back several steps. Quarters fell from the mouth of the machine, slowly at first, then at an alarming rate. The coins fell, bounced, and rolled all over the floor. The crowd gulped with fascination. "'Holy catfish!' said one of the men. "'How long since that blast of things paid off?' "'Looks like this is the first time,' said one of the others. "'You guys keep quiet,' yelled Oki. The coins continued to fall for what seemed like a record time. The crowd was spellbound. Oki watched in silent fury. And the aliens were more confused than they had been when the machine wasn't paying off. The one-armed bandit finally coughed out its last quarter. The three bell-fruit wheels came to an abrupt halt, as though an inner spring had snapped. The machine broke down. Certain observers later reported that the poor thing actually looked exhausted. The sheriff burst in the door with Nugget McDermott close behind. "'Sheriff, I want you to arrest these two tin horns,' cried Oki. "'Tin horns?' Sartan's face was creased with bewilderment. "'What's wrong, Oki? asked the sheriff. "'Take a look for yourself. These two bugged my machine and then broke it down. Look at that money all over the floor.' Torl smiled. "'We meant no harm, sir.' "'The hell you didn't mean no harm. You were out to rob me. We were only experimenting. That's their crooked experiment right there.' said Oki, pointing a finger at the deactivated one-armed bandit. I want them locked up until that machine's paid for. All right, said the sheriff. You two better come with me. But, sir, Sartan protested, we merely wanted to know how the machine functioned. You see, we are from Capella, and— Capella? exclaimed the sheriff. Where is that? I never heard of the place. Well, it is not a part of your earth. Oh, well, why didn't you say so before? The sheriff winked at the crowd. You mean you boys are from out of this world? That is correct, Sartan grinned proudly. Well, well, that does make a big difference. The sheriff turned to the crowd. All right, boys, grab them and hustle them over to the jailhouse. A group of men slowly closed in on the two aliens. Torl and Sartan backed away toward the wall. I believe they are angry, brother, thought Sartan. But why? inquired Torl. I do not know. Do you suppose the machine represented some form of religious deity? Exceeding le possible, Torl answered. As the men came closer, Oki yelled, Just get them two crackpots. I'll plug the first man that touches that money. 
The men were diverted by Oki's warning. They didn't notice until it was almost too late that the two strangers were halfway out the door. "'Get after them!' the sheriff bellowed. The aliens ran as though their lives were at stake, which was true, following the same route they had taken into town. The crowd followed them as far as the edge of town. From there they hurled rocks. Torl and Sartan continued to run at breakneck speed, praying they could reach the safety of the ship. Once they looked behind them and saw that the crowd of angry men had given up the chase. Halfway back to their ship they passed a sign, though they didn't bother to stop and read it. You're now leaving Jubilation, USA, the doggondest, cheeriest little town in America. Come back soon. End of Jubilation, USA